Hi guys, welcome back to our uh, interview series. Um, Ian is not here yet, hopefully he will join us later. Uh, I'm very happy to have with me uh, David Imre from Clemor Castings. Thanks for coming, David. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation. It's a pleasure. Uh, David, I usually ask uh, this question to, I mean, I, I, we had before you, we had, I don't know if you know, Martin Gibbons, who created Salt Point. Yes, and, I, 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 I don't think I've met Martin, but I know of his rules and I know Martin's work, yes. Yeah, I, I, I usually ask, you know, when when guys like you who are in, in, in war gaming many years and you, know, you, you, you are, you know, quite famous in our hobby, how did you start? I mean, how, how was the process for you to start? And when, when it came to you, uh, when did you decide, oh, I need to make my own minis? I mean, um, you were not happy with the things, with the, with, with the products that were outside. You wanted to create a better product. What was this process uh, until you created Claymore Castings? So, uh, to answer the first part of the question about what got me interested in wargaming, yeah. I was in a local newsagent buying my copy of White Dwarf in 1984, I think it was. I had just left school and um, I was um, really interested in science fiction gaming and, and fantasy gaming. And right next to White Dwarf, there was a magazine called War Games Illustrated. And yeah. on the front cover, there was some Napoleonic skirmishers fighting over a bridge. I said, well, I have to have a look at that. That looks interesting. Picked it up and I was just sold. It just brought all the movies that I had seen over the years, all the epic movies, Spartacus, everything like that, it's, it just seemed to me that I, I could do that because there's nothing more interesting than history. People go on about science fiction and fantasy and all, and all the freedom you have, but from my research in history over the years, it's actually stranger than reality. So I'm actually hooked on, on history and, 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 and the spectacle of history as well. And I think that the, the art that comes with, with miniatures and the history and everything that goes on with that is something that we could learn a lot of lessons from. When I got round to um, launching Claymore Carsons, it was quite a simple thing that had happened. Um, my wife had bought me an Osprey book for Father's Day or... or, or um, or Christmas, I can't remember which one it was, and it was the Battle of Otterburn, 1388. And inside there was a fabulous plate of the battle, and I just thought, I have to do that. I, I need to do that as a project. And they started searching around for miniatures to fit the purpose, and I just couldn't see anything that, that fitted what we wanted to do. So got in touch with a sculptor, the famous Paul Hicks, who started a lot of button figures for us, and it was a, a, a beautiful job that he did, and he captured the look that was in that Osprey book perfectly. I visited the battlefield at Otterburn several times and read the book and walked up and down, looked at where the positions are, and I was just fascinated by that period of history. The strange thing is that Scottish history doesn't interest me at all. I quite find the, the, the wars of Robert the Bruce and Wallace a bit boring. I don't know if it's because it's everywhere around about here. Yeah, but I'm, I'm more interested in, in other countries' medieval history rather than my own. So I then started to look at the, the Hundred Years' War and the early period of the Hundred Years' War. And again, I couldn't find anything that, that was perfect for the early phases of the Hundred Years' War because the, the poetry of the early Hundred Years' War um, and, and the, the the stories of Cressy and the Bottle of Morley and, and all these things were, were fascinating, but I couldn't find the miniatures. They were all too late. So that's when we started to develop Claymore Castings into an early Hundred Years' War period, and we're very lucky to get Mark Bickley to sculpt some of the figures for us, and I could tell when Mark was sculpting these figures that he was interested in it as well. So... so Sorry for that long-winded answer, but no, 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 no. That's the point. It was very interesting. Uh, but did you, um, did you, did, do you have any, any? I mean, I'm sure you have input, but 
um, are you a paint, you're a good painter, do you sketch, do you give like a, some type of a sketch of your ideas to the sculptures, how, to the sculptors, how is the process, it's, I'm very interested to, to know how your process goes until, you, you know, ending with a beautiful claymore casting. Well, it's, it's a mixture of, I'm very lucky that Matt has a really great knowledge of the Hundred Years' War period. So whenever we're talking about doing a, 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 a city militia, Pavasia, or a Genoese crossbowman, or whatever it is, Matt has a good idea of what that should look like. I like to research history myself, and um, I've been over measuring flags at the National Museum of Scotland. I went over to measure Caver's enzyme. I've been in measuring the hilts on claymores. I've, I've done a lot of research into the, the, the medieval period myself because it totally fascinates me. But I have to be honest and say that Matt and I work together very closely, but he has a fantastic knowledge of the period, which shows in the miniatures as well. It's true that before your, uh, your castings, it, it, there was a gap uh, in the Hundred Years' War. There was a lot of stuff for the late part, like after 1400s, but there was absolutely nothing for Gracie, Poitiers, um, the, Britain, uh, the Britain Wars of Succession, where, you know, you had less plates, more cloths, uh, more um, chain mail, and there was, there was a gap. There was a lot of things missing, and I think Claymore managed to, to fill this gap very, very, very well, of course. Uh -huh. Uh, well, thank you very much. Yes, uh, uh, definitely there was something missing in that period and, and we were lucky to find that. And again, I don't release anything with a business mind. It's purely selfish in what I want to have in my own collection. Um, so when the ranges develop, it's based on what I want rather than any kind of monetary value. Uh, to what we're doing. Um, of course, we, we, we have a business and we take it very seriously and we, we we treat the business very seriously and we take everybody's order with respect when they, when they place an order with us. But the reality is I'm, I'm basically getting soldiers that I want to play with. How do you see now? Uh, I mean, now uh, Claymore is developing and you have now more miniatures and there's more choices. Uh, where do you see Claymore uh, going into the future? Are you planning to go to other eras? You're planning to expand the Hundred Years' War era? You want to go to another medieval era? I mean, what, you have any plan forward? Uh, yes, we have a plan to cover many different periods in the medieval e era, um, but we, we still have a long way to go on the Hundred Years' War yet. We've got um, dismounted horse archers to do. We have lots more mounted knights' packs to produce. We have lesser armed crossbow men to get. We have some um, skirmish type um, people to produce. So there's lots to be covered in the Hundred Years' War period yet. And Matt and I have, have a list. I don't like to share the list because when you put a list out, people look at that list and think that this is coming next or what's coming next. But the, the way that we work is we, we, we're more fluid to that than that. And every time Matt gets the greens back from what he sculpted, he could see where we're going next. So still a lot to cover in the hundred years war, early hundred years war period yet. Lots to produce for that, but we do have plans to move on to later periods as well, and that's mostly because that's what my passion is for the whole of the hundred years war later periods as well, right through to um, some of the, the the conflicts in the Hussite wars and and beyond. So lots of plans for the future, but it takes a long time for to get a packy figures done. And that's because we're more interested in the quality of the figure than the amounts of figures. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> it will take a long time to get uh, everything done that we want. But when it's done, hopefully it will be done correct. From the ones I got, I have to say that the quality is amazing. It's really amazing. I, I, I You know how much I like your, your miniatures. You know my Poitier project and uh, everything is from your miniatures. And I'm waiting for the new Mounty to arrive, as you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. But um, the quality is, uh, is seriously is um, is extraordinary. Well, th thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, we do we do take pride to make sure that it's it's right what we send out. But there is some cleaning up the figures that that does need to be done. Um, always, there, yes. I think there is always a little bit that needs to be done. But we try to make sure when we're packing the figures um, that we're looking at the figures and we're making sure that everybody's getting something a decent product.
Now you're having the new mountain that everybody's talking about coming soon. And uh, I booked the first 24 already. You know that. Don't forget it. I'll put it in that. <laughs> um, these are uh, beautiful, beautiful miniatures. Um, these are uh, for Gracie and Poitiers, uh, English and French, as you told me. They can be uh, painted as both, correct? Yes, I think I made, a, I made a big mistake when I started the Hundred Years' War by labelling stuff as nationalities, whereas if I was to do it again, I'd be a lot more generic because, I mean, an English knight and a French knight would mostly look the same. There would be very little difference in, in how they look. And it was the same with a Scottish knight and an English knight at the Battle of Waterborne. They, they, they would look identical in their, in their harness uh, and their equipment. There would just be less Scottish knights than, than English knights, but their equipment would be of the same quality. Um, so, again, I made a mistake by putting nationalities towards things. I should have just labelled them as, as the troop type um, for the period, I think. And that's what we're going to do with these mounted um, knights that are coming out. They're just going to be um, European knights. Yeah, no, they're very beautiful, um, and they're coming in uh, uh, in plastic, correct? Is that, is, is that what I'm saying correct? They're plastic? They're no, nice. no, or metal? No, no, they're metal. No, metal, yeah. 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 They're, they're lead, yeah. They're just, um, the greens, the sculpts look like they're plastic because there's matte sculpts and, and um, the, the material that comes out grey, but they oh. are they're actually, they're getting casted right now as we speak. Uh, and mm -hmm. the people that are casting, so I'm, I'm waiting and watching the post every day to see if they come back. But the reality is that this period that we're in with COVID-19, everything's yeah, taking longer than usual. So um, it could be maybe um, two to three weeks, but I'm hoping that they're going to arrive back soon because I've got somebody who wants 24 of them right away. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing uh, your crazy project. Um, yes. Yes. Very beautiful painted miniatures, um, and I've I've seen that you have some amazing heraldry. Especially your flags are absolutely beautiful. Uh, are you thinking this? Uh, I, first of all, are you thinking of putting uh, flags in uh, the Claymore casting uh, shop, or it's something you don't think about it? We, we are flags, have you know, transfers, you know. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We, we have flags and transfers in the shop already. Um, Ian McDonald, who's a good friend of mine. That mm -hmm. owns flags of war. Um, oh. when, I've been twisting his arm to do the 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 night stuff, the earlier period of the Hundred Years' War, to suit the miniatures. So there is a lot of early French and English um, Hundred Years' War flags in our. Yes, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You have the I forgot about it. You have the Otterborn flags for the Battle of Otterborn. Yeah, you're right. You have all this. Yeah. Uh, uh, but we have brand new English Hundred Years War flags in the shop just now. I haven't publicised them well enough, I don't think, but they're they're in the shop right now. Something that I wanted to ask you because I uh, I feel very close to you in what way you have exactly the same fascination as I do with Hundred Years War. I mean, you know that I only interested in that period and my armies are from that period and I I, I I you know I do history or fight battles. Um. What caught you so much fascinating? I mean, you told us at the beginning that you, I feel you are like me, you are 100% fascinated and, and concentrating the Hundred Years' War. Or the... Yeah, it, it, it's the poetry of it. Um, it's, it's, um, I mean, I've got this, this is something that Ian MacDonald made for me from Flags of War. And oh, it's very this beautiful. Is, uh, this, is, um, Here, yeah. this is Sir John Swinton at the, the Battle of Halliton Hill. And um, he, he gave a speech before the death charge down the hill into the English archers. And the speech was, Oh, my brave countrymen, what fascination has seized you today that you stand like deer to be shot instead of indulging your ancient courage and meeting your enemies hand to hand. Let those who will descend with me that we may gain victory and life or fall like men. So it's the poetry of the period. I mean... Nobody knows yeah. if that quote is true. If, if Sir John Swinton did give that quote before the death charge happened at, at, at the hill, but it's the whole poetry of the period and and the chivalry and and you know that chivalry in the Hundred Years' War wasn't the way that we see chivalry now. It was a ruthless, blood, bloody affair, um, and it ravaged France and, and destroyed uh, France and, and 
There's large chevauchets that went through were, were horrible things to happen. <clears throat> but it's the colour, it's the banners, it's the pageantry, it's the poetry of it all. Yeah. It, it, just, it just engages me. Tell me, tell me about your project, your crazy project. I'm very interested. Just, you know, uh, let's publicise it a bit. Um, how many miniatures are you planning? Are you planning to fight a battle? Um, you're going into a lot of detail, I saw. Yes. Um, I think it was two two years ago, maybe even three years ago now, I um, was very lucky to be part of the group that put on the Battle of Cressy at Partizan War Game Show yeah. in Nottingham with Simon Chick, Mark Bickley, Dave Andrews uh, and myself uh, that went, went down to put, to put the miniatures out for that. We were all fascinated by medieval period, so it's very much like-minded people and friends putting that game on. Um, and when I saw that game and what it could look like, I thought, I've got to have that myself. But what a lot of work is involved with doing something to that standard, to that size. So I wanted to have that, but just using Claymore castings mostly, rather than using other manufacturers' figures. So it's taken a lot of years to get the range to a point where I could possibly put on or, or collect something that's right for that period because um, we need to get lots of mounted knights done. That's what we're covering now. So now that they're starting to get done, developed and, and produced now, I can I can start on the, the English armies and men at arms and the stuff that's needed. Um, and when they're done, the, the mounted knights will be ready to go. The project will probably take me about two or three years to do, to get it the size that I want it to be. But I'm hoping to be gaming with it right away. Um, another good friend of mine, lots of good friends <laughs> I mentioned here today, is Thomas Foss, and and Thomas is is a is a rule writer that I've um, I've been friends with Thomas for for years, and uh, Thomas has done lots of great little uh, rules over the years, and we got discussing when Tom, Thomas came over to visit me here in Scotland from California, and we were sitting one evening having a drink and discussing it all, and we decided right we're going to write a set of rules. He said, so what, what is it, David, that you want to see in your set of rules? Because Thomas is all about the pillars of rules. What is it you're trying to achieve to get that sorted out? And just like the miniature range, there's something missing in a lot of the rules that I'm playing for the early Hundred Years War period. Uh, it's got to feel like that period of time for me. So we're working through what that would look like just now, and we're playtesting the rules. So we're, we're going for the quality and, and the type of troops um, is the main part of the rule. So you could have a unit of knights that could be really good, but they could also be really bad as well. They might not be that great. So it's not just the type of troop that's going to be in the rules, it's their actual quality as well. So it's going to be the type of troop and their quality, and we're hoping that that's going to feel like more like the medieval period as well. That you might have a, a, a unit of city town pavassiers that might be very well. <coughs> Um, might be elite, they might be very well drilled, they might have experience in battle. You might have another unit of city militia pavassiers that have actually just taken to the field for the very first time. So what we're trying to do is, is get the troop type and their class into the rules. And um, can't really share too much about it just now because it's 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 really just getting play tested, but I'm quite excited about it. We've, we've nailed the armour type, we've nailed the morale, we're, we've got the movement the way we want it to be. Uh, we're just looking at little things about giving bonuses to the English and shooting and giving bonuses to the French and charging. And once we get that cracked, we'll, we'll open the rules up to more playtesters. You promised me I'm going to playtest the rules. You promised me. Absolutely. I think with, with your knowledge that and your, your, your love of this period, then I think it's essential that you, you're part of the playtesting team. I'm waiting for this. Yeah, one of the rules that we're looking at is the, the flinch rule or the, the push rule, as, we, as we're going to call it. Um, you know, in, in some rules, there's been many rules that have an effect of actually makes your troops move in a certain direction. I don't like the idea that the shooting can move could make your troops move away from the battle because the whole tactics that the English had with their, with their mass archery was to funnel the enemy into a killing area. That's the, what in front of the man at arms, yes. In front of the man at arms, yes. So we're going to have this push rule that if your unit takes so many casualties, it's going to have an effect that it's going to move in a certain direction. Um, but the unit has to take, not just hits, it has to take casualties for to push them into that. Because you can have effective shooting or you can have... 
uh, shooting that, that, that maybe hits but doesn't cause any any casualties in the unit. So that's how we're going to get round some of that, is that if yeah. the hits are transformed into kills, then the unit that you're shooting at will, will move in a certain way. And it'll move yeah. in a way that will either push them back a little bit or, or into the battle rather than away from the shooting because we don't feel that that's right. Well, it's, it's, it's still a, a long way from deciding on the final um, part of that yet. Um, but however, um, we are going to be looking at making the rules not simple to play, but mm. simple enough that doesn't give you a headache every time you get a combat. Yeah. 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 So that's what we're going to try. We're trying to achieve. And, and it's all about your class type. Remember, I was telling you about the, the class type of the troop rather than what the troops are. So in the charts that we do, as long as you know what class troop your troop, your, your your unit is, then all the mod there's one chart for melee, one chart for shooting, one chart yeah. for, for morale. Then you adjust it with your class, um, your class type. So that's how we're going to get round a, a lot of the complications about um, resolving melees and such. Uh, but I don't want to say too much about that because yeah, yeah, Thomas, sure, of course, Thomas, Thomas, that's that, that's writing the rules for us. Um, we, we, we play tests once a week via uh, uh, online, just like this. I've got the table set up in the background for Sunday's play test. Yeah, and every time we play test, there's there's a, a little change that happens, as you can imagine. So um, although we've got the core of the rules the way we want it, we're, we're trying to put the flavour in now. You know, yeah. what, what what would make them English mass archery? What would what would that look like? We need, we need to give the, the French a chance to, to win this. So for French charging as well, there needs to be something in there that gives the French that bonus for, for doing that. Or mounted, doesn't yeah. have to be French, just mounted knights that chance to, to engage with with, uh, with archers. So it's all about the, the little um, nuances and intricacies of the rules now about getting them to feel like the period. So that, that's what we're doing uh, every Sunday playtest. That's fantastic. When you when, when you said you're planning to open it a bit more, when is this? Uh, when do you plan to do this? After a few months, uh, how do you see it? Well, we're we're just about there. Um, mm -hmm. Having said that, every time we do a play test, we decide on on a, a little change here on there. What we don't want to do is open up to play testers to come back and tell us that it doesn't feel like the period. Yeah. What we, want, what we want to do is get it to feel like the period before we give it to the play testers. And then mm -hmm. the playtesters will be able to to look at our charts and look at our our, our armor types and our and our weapon types and, and and come back to us to see if they feel as if it works or, or it doesn't work. Because as you know, a, a good set of rules has to be play tested quite a bit. Yeah, of course, of course. We'll not not be releasing anything under the the banner of Claymore Castings until it gets quite a lot of play testing. Yes, for sure. Some some rules are play tested for years sometimes if they if they. The designers are happy. Um, and, we, and we won't get it wrong. We, we, we will get some things wrong in the rules. There's not a, a thing as a, as a perfect set of rules. And one of the, it's the same as the miniatures that we're producing. This is a totally selfish thing for me. These are mm -hmm. rules that I would like to play with. I mean, I've played some fantastic rules. Line Rampant is just fantastic for skirmish based rules, small, small mm -hmm. action games. I play two of the strongest at, at my local club constantly by Simon Miller. Brilliant yeah. rules, fantastic rules, but I just want something to feel like the early hundred years war period more. And, I agree and, with you. and that's why we're being totally selfish and 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 focusing on that. I'm writing a lot of the history for the rules as well, so the rules will have scenarios and a little bit of history, starting at the Breton War of Succession and working its way through the history and all the all the characters that was in that right the way up to Cressy. So we'll have. Um, all, all, all the main players um, mentioned, and, and hopefully we'll give them that little bit in the rules that let, let you feel like it's that that character you're playing as well, because that's important. Because as well as the troop types, you need to you need to feel like you're commanding Oxford at Morley. You need to feel like you're you're John the Blind charging at Cressy. So we're, we're putting these characters uh, into the rules with tokens as well. So as well as the unit, you're going to have some kind of they feel that you're 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 playing these characters. Ah, okay, you're gonna get you're gonna give character traits. Yes, you know the role, the War of British Succession is uh, one of my favorite periods, and uh, you should put uh, Thomas Duckworth. I like some Thomas Duckworth. Lovely, <laughs> lovely. <family. laughs> 
Yeah. The, the, plan um, is that we, the plan is that we don't want to get the characters to overbalance the rules. We want them to give just a yeah, lot of course. flavor to the rules, but the, the main thing to me is units. Fine yeah, and yeah. That's the main thing, yeah. I was talking about the rules, and I will tell you something that uh, Martin Gibbons told me, uh, and I found it actually very true. He said to me that there are some rule sets that when you create rule sets uh, um, one-off, uh, you see that slowly, slowly, people after some years uh, leave these rules. Uh, these rules get abandoned if they go to new rule sets. Um, he told me for a rule set to be successful, except, of course, if the rules are good for the period that they are written for, is to have always something to give to the player. Some, um, um, some installment of a campaign, some installment of special um, uh, units, uh, new, uh, more specialized army lists, um, uh, something you know, that will, 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 will rejuvenate his interest every once in a while. No, I think that's a very good uh, <laughs> Keeping it fresh and up to date. I mean, I, we, we plan on, and again, this is probably more selfish than from a business point of view. Now we've got the miniatures looking right. We need the rules to feel right. So this is really a, a project that's aimed for myself. So uh, as long as, as I'm interested in it, which will be forever, because I can't see myself ever getting uninterested in uh, medieval warfare, then oh, I'll, be, I'll be looking to, to produce something that will support it. There will be... Um, Lots to cover in that period. I mean, we, we look at some of the well-known battles, but there is loads of little engagements and, and, and scenarios and things that, that could be gamed as well. So lots to do in that period. Joanna Flanders um, is, is, is one of the char characters we're focusing on the first edition of Rules for because that is a fantastic character. Yeah. Um, you, you know, um, it's the, the War of the Breton Succession is something that's not talked about enough. It is a brilliant campaign, uh, and you've got the, some of the best characters that end up at Cressy in that campaign exactly. as well. Mm -hmm. This is, um, probably can't see that very well, but I'll try. This is one of the characters from the Breton War of Succession. That, this, is, uh, this, is, this is Blois, isn't it? Charles of Blois, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah that's with right. His, yeah, Charles of Blois. Yeah. This is with his, with his banner, not the Briton banner where he was... Uh, because he has the, also sometimes the Brittany banner when he was considered uh, Duke of Brittany, but this is his family banner, the Blois banner, correct? Family banner, and eventually we will get the, 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 the Brittany banner done as well, but th this was painted for me by George, fantastic figure painter. Yeah, George is very good, George is yeah. very good. So he painted that character for me, and um, we, so the characters will be important in the rule. So this guy is going to be in, in the rule set as well. He's going to have some special abilities. Basically, I have to say, uh, David, is that um, you manage to do everybody else's dream. You manage to do your hobby uh, business. I think this is something we succeeded because, and why you're successful, you know, in all businesses, in all work, if you like what you're doing, if you love what you're doing, you're successful. If you don't like it, you're never going to be. That's how life is. Uh, yes. But you manage. <laughs> yeah, but you you manage to you manage to um, you would have done all these things. I can imagine without being claymore castings, being just David, you would have probably painted big armies. You could have probably found miniatures you like. You probably made your own rules. Um, and this is what I I'm impressed, and, and that's why your whatever you do is successful is because. Basically, it's something you like, it's something you do for yourself. And uh, okay, it is business now, but it's basically something that you would, miniatures you would buy, it would be rules you would play. And when we love something, I, I think it reflects to the other people and becomes successful. Yes, and that, 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 that's great. I mean, uh, to me, it's all about my friends in the hobby. It always has been about my friends. When, when you look at anything I do, it's collaborations that I do. It's about working with people, about getting things right. Um, I have the same doctor at my work as well. I mean, the hobby isn't my job. I have a day job as well. You wouldn't think it by the amount of time I spend on the hobby, and that's for true, but I, I, I do have a day job, a very demanding day job, and, and this is where I get my... This is where I relax and where I 
I, I, I get my enjoyment from this part of the, uh, of the hobby. The dream will be to turn it into a living. Um, Claymore Castings is, 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 is you've, you've so kindly said, been, you know, great miniatures and success, but there still isn't a salary in that for a, for a man, you know, so yeah. um, I still have to keep my day job going, but that doesn't stop the passion. And, and the want for it to be, you know, and maybe one day I could live the dream and actually do, do play more castings for a living. Well, the one thing that I'm going to ask you to do at some point will be to help us with one of the scenarios. Um, your your protea collection is fantastic, and hopefully we'll get some photographs of that for the rule book. I know that's cheeky to ask. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be great. In your miniatures, uh, makes it makes. Um, Makes the makes the miniature look much more beautiful than um, a miniature that's full of plates. You know what I mean? The variety that you see there. I don't know if, if you get my point. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I like the later Andrew's War period as well. I mean, I love that period, um, especially when you get to fourteen twenty. Um, the battles around about that period really fascinate me. So yeah. I'm, I'm very interested in that too, but. Uh, for when, when I play with the miniatures or paint the miniatures or whatever I do with it, it's got to feel like the right thing. And the one thing that, that I learned when I started research in this period was the transition from partial plate, the uncovered period, to the Dupont covered period, to the full plate period, all, all the different... And, and you know, every, every, every little change that happens in that small period of time makes it feel like the period if you get it right and uh, and yes um, we don't know an awful lot about some of the stuff that happened we really don't and and I get I get a good laugh when people tell us that the hilt of th the sword wrong or the archer's drawing drawing his bow wrong or or something like that because we really don't know we, we, we just we're we're, 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 we're doing the the research we're, we're learning things and one thing I've learned about this period is, when you think you've understood something and you've learned something, you read something else that just throws it out the window. So constant research and constant looking at it is the way to do. I mean, I just read books. I'm not a, an archaeologist. I'm not a historian. I just like to research and, and look, look at things. And when I see something, I see illustrations, I know if it's right just by looking at it. And I don't know why, but I just know it's right. And um, and, and that's why I think that... Uh, when we're, we've got a lot to fill in the Claymore range yet to get all these different armour types and troop types right. So although we've got quite a, a lot of figures in the range now, still a long way to go till it feels like that period. Can you, uh, could, uh, you, you actually uh, gave me a pass for a good question. Um, can you recommend a couple of good books for the couple of good books that you could suggest that you read also? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If, if, what I'll do is at the end I'll compile a reading list, if that's okay, and, and give it yeah. to you. Because yeah, there's, sure, sure. A, there's a couple of books that I use that are, that are like a Bible, and mm -hmm. I don't want to pronounce the author's names wrong, so I'll, I'll produce the list for you uh, on, on yeah. that. Okay. Do you do you look at um, your competition? Do you check what's what's going around? Do you check what uh, the competition uh, produces? Um, and for the medieval era, if it wasn't for Claymore, which manufacturer you would get for your armies? Oh, there's, there's loads um, of, of medieval manufacturers I, I am collecting at the same time. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't give a damn what anyone else does. Um, I, I wish them all the best and, 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 and you know, nothing but, but goodwill to other manufacturers. Um, Futsal Miniatures with their Barnes War range that's come out recently is a fantastic range of figures. Um, yeah. Beautifully done um, uh, by Paul. Uh, and another range that I will start to collect myself. But I really, um, to answer your question, I don't really look at anything and think to myself, well, they're doing that or what. It's purely because I want to see the miniatures in my collection the way I want to see them. If I was to swing the camera around, you see I've got boxes and boxes of Perry miniatures here waiting mm. to start my later 100 years war collection, which I will do at some point as well, once mm. I get the Bessie period done. 
um, if I could resist um, in painting them. I mean, the, the Perry's, Perry's ranges have just been so influ influential over the years and what they've done. Um, I think that it's, it's, it's one of the, the, the things that's kept me interested in the medieval period is, is the Perry Miniatures um, Agincourt range. But yeah. again, when I started to research the period and I, f I fell in love with the early Hundred Years' War period, it just didn't feel right for gaming that. So that, no. that's, that's why uh, Claymore uh, Castings uh, came, came on board. Um, I'm sure I'm missing some other manufacturers out here somewhere uh, that I collect m many things. I mean, um, some beautiful ranges out there uh, right now. And, and when I do my Cressy range, there will be some Perry miniatures here and there fit into it. And um, th there will be some uh, other things get, get put into to give... Variation, yeah. I, I mean, in my opinion, a knight would fight in whatever he was comfortable in or whatever he had. Um, he doesn't have to be um, having the latest armor. He might be uh, somebody who's used to putting something on the same way as he's always done. It's, it's such a, a transitional period that you can't you can't just say that stops at that period and that starts on that day. And um, if you look at the the visors that we've got for the thirteen eighty eight knights that we have we've got some of the hound skull helmets starting to look with a with a pig shape i mean mm -hmm. they're starting to arrive about 1350 on the battlefield but they're not common but th th there were a couple of people who might have had them and when yeah. you get to poitier then th they're starting to see more of that developing and as it goes on through the period then they're becoming more common and it's the same with it with the with the ta with the tassets and uh, all the other parts of the armor as well, it's it's a, it's a development over a long period of time, and um, I, I think um, one of the the movies that I that I laugh at a lot is um, the Thirteenth Warrior with Andrea yeah. Uh, yeah, Banderas, isn't it? Antonio yeah, Banderas, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you see the Vikings there wearing what looks like gladiator helmets, and and it's a laugh. But do you know what? Who knows? Some of that stuff might have been carried over for hundreds of years. Why do you think we have um, so little findings regarding the Hundred Years' War? We, uh, we, we don't even know where the famous beach, beach battles were for, actually. We have no clue. Is that correct, what I'm saying? Yes, there's a lot yes, of battlefields, and, and you, read, you read different books. I mean, the eight-ton book that I'm reading now, I um, can't remember if I'm pronouncing that right, but the book I'm reading now, even the divisions, who's leading the divisions, he's got in different areas of the battle at Cressy. Um, historically, we've always believed that Northampton was in command um, with Arundel uh, on, on the English left flank. Mm -hmm. But the book I'm reading now has Northampton in, in the centre division uh, with the king. So, you know, there's just so much that if you were to read all the, the sources from the period, it's so conflicting. And I think one of the points in the books I'm reading just now is the reason it's so conflicting is people who are writing that are seeing the battle from their viewpoint, from their point of view at that one given time in that battle. And what may look like the truth to them might not look like the truth to somebody else that's looking at the battle from a different viewpoint. Yeah, so when, right. when they mention who was there and who did what and what, what scenery was there and where the river was and where the village was and stuff like that. Somebody might see it one way and somebody on the other end of the battlefield might see it completely different. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, we have many sources and not all of them are accurate, I can imagine. So you have to take bits and pieces from everywhere. But, just, you can tell me if this is looking okay and it works or not, but this is my man cave that I'm in just now. Very beautiful. So Very nice. I have I have the table that I'm working on. I, what I do is I like to, to set up um, a project as I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. And then I can see how it's going to look. Because one of the things I like to do is take games to shows. Yeah. Uh, and put games out and talk to people about what we're just like we're doing now. It's just talking to people about the period at the table, engaging with them and, and getting a bit of their knowledge. And they tell me that, did you know that this was at that period? And did you know this? And did you know that? And, and, and it's brilliant. So I don't know if you can see that very well. I'll take some pictures of the stuff that we're, we're working on. So you could yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, yeah, I've seen it, yeah. Yeah, but then I have all the other projects that I'm working on in my library and, uh, and such round about me as well. So really, really nice little man cave that I have for working on projects. 
Stuart. Yeah, it's very nice. Very I nice. I don't think I can get the camera any closer than no, that. No, no, no need, no need, no need. Just an idea to your know, workspace, and uh, it would be very nice. There's no, no, no need. The workspace is quite tight. You know, yeah. But it does get in a mess. <laughs> and there's all my paints and stuff there. Very nice. Thanks, thanks for this thing. Um, uh, but how do you see Claymore expanding? What, what would we like to see Claymore in the next five, six years? What would we like to see? Would like to see different sizes of miniatures? You're going to stay in 28? You will expand from 100 years war? I asked you the same question before, but um, are you going to go to medieval eras or are you going to go to totally different eras uh, from medieval? How do you see Claymore in five, ten years' time, let's say? I'm going um, Right now, at this point, it's, um, as you know, it's impossible to, to forecast what, where things go and how things happen and what interest changes things. But right now, Claymore is going to focus on medieval, the medieval period. And we, we will branch either before or after the, the period that we're doing just now. That's for sure, because that, that's where my interests lie. And how quickly we, quick we do that? We get people who email us saying the miniatures are fantastic, but you ever thought about doing um, the later period because we really would like to see this kind of animation in the later period. And, and yeah, and I, I reply to people and say, we do plan that, but it, it's, a, it's a long period. Um, it's time to get, the, to get it right and to develop it. Every single order that I get for Claymore Cassins makes a new figure possible. It's as simple as that. Every single ounce of profit that comes into Claymore Cassins is turned into producing new miniatures. So if the orders continue to flow and people are interested, we'll produce more and more figures as time goes on. I will be producing new figures anyway because that's what I want to do. But how quickly we get things done depends on the success of the people that are supporting Claymore Cassins. That, yeah. That's for sure. So, David, we're talking about books and you brought your books, the ones you are reading, uh, and would be good uh, for all of us to see, and uh, maybe would be good for us uh, for more information about the period. So what do you have for us here? Uh, the, one, the one book that I would recommend anyone that's getting into the Cressy period and, and the Bretton War of Succession is Alfred Byrne, and it's uh, the book on the Cressy War. It's, it's uh, quite an old book now but it's got fantastic information in it. It's a really good book, and it was recommended to me by Matt Bickley um, many years ago, many years ago. And uh, I, I got a copy of the book from Matt, and it took me four years to give him it back because it's my bedtime reading every night. And every time I think I've learned something in this book, I learn something new. So Pressy War books, fantastic one for starting this period if you want to get the history. Yeah, that's good. For looking at the troop types, one of the books that I've really enjoyed from Osprey recently um, is their Longbow versus Crossbowman. Looks very good. And one of the things that really tickled me with it was you'd be thinking you're looking at a Claymore Carson when you look at the illustrations in this Osprey book. Exactly, the left one. Actually, I ordered some crossbows. The left one is exactly like yours. Yeah, so uh, it's yeah. validating that we're getting it right when, when I see people talking about this period and, you know, 1337 to, to 1360 and, and the figures look like what we're producing. The one, the other, I mean, I'm a big fan of Osprey books. People criticise them quite a bit, but they, they inspire me quite a lot. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. David Nichols writes some very good books. Yeah, excellent books. And the one plate that really got me started in Claymore Carson's is this plate here. I'll just find it. Yeah, this is the Battle of Waterborne. Yeah, this is what started it all for me. That one plate, and I thought, that just looks right. Looks like, I thought, that's fantastic. So that started it all. A new book that's come out from Osprey again one that really shows the, the, the development of the armour is the Shrewsbury book that's come out. I want to buy this, it's good. Yeah, you can see that the armour is, again, like some of our later period Claymore Cassins. Yeah. So, Otterburn at Shrewsbury. Um, one book that I don't have at hand just now, that I think um, just get the name of it, that I think is really worth a read as well, 
Um, just find that one out. It's the Battle of Cressy book, and it's um, by Eaton and Bart. It's a really okay. good one. I will have a look also. That's I will good. have a look also. And another good one is the camp and the campaign books on, on Cressy. That's yeah, this I have. Brilliant. Yeah. I've actually got so many that... Um, I can imagine, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> But the, the one thing that, that makes it really good for me is when I look at these books is I could check that the period and the armour that they're portraying in that looks like the miniatures we're portraying. So I think I think it's, it's validating what we're doing. Um, miniature, like a plate from a, an illustration in one of these books I've mentioned, that's how I see it. The, the movement and, and the, the, the way they look, the way that they're holding the weapon, the way that their armour drapes when they're when they're when they're moving away and Matt and I really want to get that right. So if somebody's holding an armor an, an axe above their head, what would the armor and, and the dress look like below it? So it's all important because it, it sells it sells the fiction, it sells the belief in, in, in what you're doing. Yeah that's perfect. Maybe I have you here one hour sorry to keep you so long. I just want to say thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. It was really interesting. You know, I can talk to you for hours. Um, I'm sure many people learned a lot of things. Um, what we will, what I'm going to recap as as a as a project manager, I do recaps always. You know, minutes of meeting. <laughs> uh, what I will recap from my chat is that um, more miniatures are coming uh, for the period, except the mounted. You you will produce more, more and more miniatures. There is a plan for later periods but not at the moment now you, you just want to beef up the hundred years war and um a rule set is coming that will be play tested soon so and very from what i understand you you gave a lot of of um you've done a lot of work for this rule set so we're looking forward to this um do you want to say anything else that I, I forgot to mention that you didn't you wanted to say something that during the chat you didn't mention that i forgot uh, please feel free before i close Nothing. I just want to thank you very much for chatting to me today and, and learning all about my my passion. And I appreciate that. And uh, thank you for the inspiration that you've been giving all us medieval enthusiasts as well by your channel that you're producing uh, some great stuff on there. And uh, thank you for coming so much. Thank you for chatting with us one hour and uh, saying all these interesting things. Um, thank you guys for watching. Uh, next week. I thank David Emery for coming today. It was brilliant chat, brilliant chat from a fellow 100 Years War enthusiast. We're not many, but I think we're going to make more. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for watching, and uh, bye-bye. Bye-bye to everyone.